And without any uh, further ado, I'd like to discuss, uh, sort of give you a little bit of background of uh, Ms. Helen Free. She is a Midwestern, I don't know, native. At least she has roots in the Midwest. She got her bachelor's at Worcester College, as well as a master's in uh, Central Michigan University. So she is very familiar with the Lower Peninsula of Michigan. After attaining her master's at Central Michigan University, she spent quite a few years in the healthcare industry, working at Miles Laboratories, which then became Bayer Laboratories, which is probably something else now. Who knows? <laughs> still Bayer. Oh, still Bayer, okay. <laughs> but in any case, uh, she's been involved in healthcare for quite a long time. In fact, actually, she and her husband developed some of the sort of dipstick approaches to monitoring blood glu monitoring glucose levels in humans, which if you are a diabetic, would be very appreciative of, because that way it would reduce the amount of sticks that, okay, and blood that has to be drawn to monitor blood, uh, mon monitor the uh, glucose. And in fact, actually she's been inducted in a variety of organizations and halls of fame because of their work not content with not content with okay uh, healthcare industry uh, okay miss free was also extremely active in the national acs organization going as far coming as far as a pre the president of our entire organization and in fact actually she is so active in the local uh, in the acs organization that the ACS decided to name a national award after her for service, okay? The, the Helen Free Award, which has been, actually, uh, it's now just awarded, the 10th award was just given out to Basam Shakashiri, okay? So it is quite an honor to receive that award in her honor. So tonight she's going to come and talk to us about dynamic communication, which is very important, especially for scientists. With any, without any more informa uh, do information, I'd like to present the mic to... I, I have, I'm already wired. Oh, cool. Thanks. <laughs> all right. Thank you all very much, and um, I, I hope you all can hear me, right? It's fine. Uh, and do I use this or the... Okay. All right. I have... Uh, series of slides which oh first you have to turn it on sorry <clears throat> this is my focus slide and I really I really um, use it just to focus. It has nothing to do with uh, communications or anything like that, anything scientific. Uh, and I, I really don't understand that because th it says the uh, speak. I don't recall any speaker displaying such contempt for the intelligence of the audience. And I don't know whether he means that he doesn't understand it either or whether it goes over his head like, uh, like a, something very simple. Anyway, uh, the only thing I recognize is this little symbol, which is Indiana University. Since I'm from Indiana. Um, when people talk about communications, there's a sender and a message and a receiver. But it really is, that's not all there is to communications. You have to have a sender and a message and a receiver but what we, you also need to do is have, have a, a, a backwards uh, arrow, arrow, which means an interplay with the receiver and the sender. And you have to have that because you have to have an understanding by the receiver in order to have whatever action it is proposed uh, taken correctly. And so that's the complete definition of, of uh, communications as I understand it. Uh, there are all kinds of communications, and they're listed on, on, on this board. And sometimes, sometimes you don't realize that you're communicating in body language, for instance. If you say, gee, I'm awfully glad, glad to meet you, 
and, and sort of withdraw, it doesn't really mean that you're very glad to meet anybody. Uh, networking and lectures and all kinds of, of uh, possibilities are ways of communicating. Formal manners, the mode of dress, and we'll, uh, we'll discuss a little bit of that later too. Um, dance, music, especially things like visual aids, uh, all those are ways of communicating. Uh, how, many, how old do you think this lady is? You, are you seeing the, the lady? Hmm? How old? 25. How many? 75? Is there anybody who doesn't see both ladies? Depending on how you look at that slide, you can see a young lady or you can see an old lady. Uh, how many see the young lady? How many see the old lady? Okay. Um, uh, I, won't, I won't describe how you see the old and young lady. You, you have to do that to your neighbor if he or she doesn't see it. The thing about it is that uh, uh, Stephen Covey and his Seven Habits of Successful Persons um, used this in one of his classes. And what he did was to, to supply a sketch of just the old lady to half the class and the other half the class got just a sketch of the young lady and he let them see this for half a, half a minute or two and then uh, collected all the uh, uh, pages from, from his class and showed them this, class, th this picture. And they almost came to blows because this side of the, of the room who had the, pic the sketch of the young lady swore up and down they couldn't see the old lady and the same in reverse for the other side. But it, it's, it's peculiar and it's, uh, um, it's important that you don't misunderstand when you're communicating. Who, how, who sees something on this slide? Yes. It's the word fly. But the word fly is in capital letters on a white background. You can see this F and L and Y. So it, it, it's important that you, you get the proper picture when you're communicating. Um, I'm going to go back here. I'm going to throw this next slide on the, on the screen, and I'm going to uh, ask you to count the number of Fs on this slide. And when I say how many, I want you all to shout out the number of Fs that you see. And, and I, I can't even hear you when you say the, the word fly or this or that. Thing. So really shout it out, the number of Fs that you can see on this slide, OK? How many? Three. You're all looking at the same slide. When I asked you, uh, this, this, is, this is about following directions. When I asked you to count the number of Fs, instead you read it, right? And then you went back and counted. And you counted this F, and this F, and this F. But there are three others. This one, this one, and this one. There are six. And some people see it, but most of us don't. Uh, the, the, when the pitcher, when the catcher goes out to the pitcher's mound, do you think he says, throw the ball in such a way that it rotates in a forward direction, allowing the air to pass underneath the ball easier than the air above it, thereby creating pressure which will press the ball downward in a sharper arc or curve than would normally occur from gravitational pull alone? Do you think that's what he says? Sure. Sure? No, come on. <laughs> But uh, this, is, this is kind of what we do. We talk in jargon, scientific, technical jargon. And often our, uh, our, the piece, people to whom we are communicating are just as, just as um, nonplussed as this guy when he's really saying, uh, uh, throw, throw a curveball. 
This is uh, the family circus picture, and Daddy is reading from a book, and he says, picture you're standing beside the water's edge. And every one of his kids has a different picture. You're standing beside the water's edge, but Billy is standing beside the ocean, and Dolly is standing beside this placid lake, and Jeffy is standing beside a river, and PJ is uh, standing beside a creek in the backyard. But they're all following directions, and the, but they're all seeing something entirely different. The, this, is, this is a, um, from, from uh, a reporter from the uh, Wall Street Journal, I believe, or the Washington Post. And what he has done is say, how, how big is a gene in terms that, that describe something familiar to you. Uh, he, he, call, he says the size of the earth is like the earth, the size of a cell is like the earth, the size of a chromosome is like a country, the size of chromosome fragments are uh, like counties, uh, the gene is like a town, and the nucleotide base pairs are like the people in the town. And this is, a, I'm sure he must have had a scientific help with this, but this is a absolutely perfect example of communications. And it's communications that, that really um, are not very well done sometimes by t technical people and scientists. I think I have a few more slides. I am going to show you, uh, uh, we're going to discuss a little bit about uh, the um, particular types of behavioral profiles that one might have. Uh, we have there's a psychological uh, instrument called the DISC program. And it divides people into high D or dominant people, high I or influential, high S or steady, and high C or conscientious people. And uh, the, the uh, descriptions of some of the people who are high D are achiever, uh, creative people, developer, uh, results oriented, or inspirational. And those kinds of behavioral profiles are what you see when you go through this long, complicated uh, uh, system. And their, their particular um, Characteristics are dominance and directness if you're a high D person. If you're a high I person, uh, you uh, uh, are interested in people uh, and you are very influential and you're socially minded. And you see here, on uh, it's the I peak on uh, uh, the behavioral profile. And some of these people are, are called counselor or inspirational. <coughs> persuader or promoter. High S people for steadiness or stability, uh, again, are achiever. And, and you, nobody is a, a pure one or the other of these, always a mixture. Uh, the achiever or the agent or the investigator, perfectionist and specialist. And then finally, the high C people are compliance and competence. I call it uh, conscientiousness as well. And th those people are uh, appraiser, creative, objective thinker, perfectionist, and practitioner, depending uh, uh, on where uh, the second uh, uh, peak might occur. Anyway, we're going to try to uh, figure out what kind of people we are. We're going to try to figure out the kind of uh, uh, whether, we, whether we belong to a high D, a high S, or a high C kind of behavior or profile. Uh, some of you have brochures. I'm sorry, I didn't expect more than 40 people, so <laughs> I only made 40 copies of this. Uh, but on the, on, the first, uh, on, on the first inside page, we talk about vertical versus lateral thinking. And uh, we who are typically technologically oriented or scientifically oriented are, are mostly, uh, we've been taught to have straight, vertical, good, logical reasoning. 
But what we should also do is figure out how to, how to do lateral thinking as well. And uh, this, is, this is sometimes in the current jargon called thinking outside a new different way to solve problems. I have a couple stories to tell you. <coughs> One is the story of the elevators. And uh, this building was an office building and it had 12 floors and uh, ev it had six elevators. And uh, every morning at 8 o'clock the elevators were jammed and people were upset because they had to wait to get up to stairs to the office. And every evening at 5 when they quit, they had the same kind of thing on the way to get down. So how would you, how would you solve this problem if you were faced with this office building? Take the stairs. Take the stairs. You can go to a health kick. But you want to tell 12th floor sometimes? Anyway, that's a good solution. What, how else could you solve the problem? Have businesses start at different times. Beg pardon? Have businesses start at different times. Have the businesses started at different times. But by golly, we're from Indiana, and we work from 8 to 5, and that's the way it is. Um, <laughs> what else could you do? Make another elevator. Build another elevator. Cost, that costs money. What else could you do? Pardon? Stagger the elevator at a time. It's right, right. Good, good, good answer. How else? You could say this bank of three elevators is only going from floors one to six, and this bank of elevators is going from seven to twelve only. But that's not how Edward de Bono, psychologist, solved the problem. <clears throat> he solved the problem by putting mirrors beside all the elevators. The problem was not the elevators. The problem was people feeling upset. And the girls would primp their hair in the elevators, and the boys would watch the girls primping their hair in the elevators, and, and they didn't mind it so much. They didn't mind waiting. So that the problem was a psychological problem on on, on, on the people, not, not in the things, not in the elevators. Uh, I have another, another uh, story to tell you. And this was about in the early days of what used to be called Persia, probably. And the caliph of Persia, one of the high level rulers, uh, had a neighbor who, who was uh, in debt to him, way deeply in debt. And his, uh, he had this beautiful daughter. But so the caliph said, if you allow me to marry your daughter, uh, I'll forgive all your debts and we'll, everybody will be happy. But of course she was in love with the boy next door and she didn't want to marry this old guy. And, um, but she, she had to. What could she do because her father made her do this? Well, they were at, during this conversation, they were <coughs> standing in a in a, a garden in a path with black and white stones on the on the path, and the caliph said, "I'll uh, I'll give you a, a trial. I will take two stones from the uh, path and put them in this bag, and I'll take a white stone and a black stone." from this uh, uh, path, and I'll put them in the bag. And if you draw the white stone, well, then you won't have to marry me. But if you draw the black stone, you will. But she saw this sneaky old guy put two black stones in the bag. What should she do? How should she get out of this? How should she solve her problem? Yeah, but then he'd see if there was, yeah. Well, that's, that's on the right track, though. She can't make the caliph do anything. Yes? Well, again, she's, she's not the one that calls the rules. Choose, but she, choose a stone and say the one left in the bag is the other color. Absolutely, absolutely. She said, oh, I, I, I dropped the stone. And of course, in the path, she, she dropped the stone. But she said, you look in the bag and you know what color I drew because the black one's still in the bag. 
It, that's lateral thinking. That's thinking outside the box. That's the kind of thinking that we, or who are nice vertical thinkers, don't often use, but, but kinds that we do. Now, with, with communications, I have this nine dots thing, when, uh, but, but we'll, we won't talk about that. It's, it's a neat thing. I told you <coughs> about the, the center fold of this uh, uh, little brochure talks about the description of high D people and high I and high S and high C people. And we said uh, the, the, uh, the dominant kind of person has a big ego, has, uh, uh, is very impatient, uh, desires change, his, uh, the, ability, the ability to get results is his greatest strength. Uh, his, the, the thing he dislikes most, his biggest fear, is being conned because he just doesn't like the people to pull wool over his eyes. And he doesn't like criticism of his self, him, himself. And the applicable words to describe this guy are direct, forceful, demanding, risk-taker, adventuresome, domineering. Do you know people like this? Picture in your mind some, picture in your mind when we go over uh, the, the, these uh, uh, descriptions um, who your what your professor might be like, uh, what your boss might be like. Pick out uh, what your parents might be like. Pick out uh, the kind of best description you can of these people. A high I person is, uh, in, a, in, a, in contrast, in contrast to uh, uh, the the. Uh, the, the uh, high D people are not the ability to get results, but people interaction. People interaction. They are emotional, they're re people or oriented and maybe disorganized, but they, uh, but they and their biggest fear is, uh, is loss of social approval. They, they put on a good front. Uh, they're concerned about the image that they project. project. And the uh, uh, words that describe this kind of person are enthusiastic, persuasive, impulsive, self-promoting, trusting, gregarious. High S people, high S people are good, steady, loyal workers. Uh, the, the description is loyal and, and they belong to the status quo and they're very cohesive. Their uh, greatest strength is they get the job done. They're good team workers. If you're, if you're a boss, you like to have lots of steady high S people on your team. And their biggest fear is lots of security, like maybe downsizing time or whatever. And they're concerned about change and new ways. And their applicable words are patient, listener, predictable, passive, possessive, do you see yourself in one of these descriptions, maybe, or someone you know? And the high C people are uh, for conscientiousness. And their description is that they're organized, perfectionist. They make great quality control people because they, they're good with details and, and accuracy. Their biggest fear is criticism of their work. In contrast to the criticism of self that the high D people have, you can criticize them personally till the cows come home, but don't criticize their work. And they, be, they may be critical of the people who do things differently. And their uh, applicable words are diplomatic, fact finder, systematic, conventional, and courteous. And so uh, write down which, whether, you're, whether you yourself are a high D, a S or C. Just write it, write it down on a piece of paper. Now it can be in between also, right? By pardon? Some people may be in between also. Of course, but what what pick your pick your top peak. Maybe you're high two things, but pick your top. Um I am a high D, high I person. 
And I worked for Jean Thomas, who was uh, a high S, high C person. I give this talk. I, I should know better. But I had a, an invitation from the uh, uh, New York State uh, Medical Technology crew to, uh, to come and give a workshop. And I walked in, this is while I was working with the research products division <coughs> of, uh, of Bayer. And I walked into Jean's office and I said, I can go, can I, Jean? I, I, I've got this invitation and uh, I can go, can I? And she said, no. And I said, I, 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 the next day I walked in and I said, and, and I, 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 knew, I knew this would, should happen because uh, Jean being a high S, high C people, a person, was a, a strictly good, gets a good steady uh, a job, accurate, she is good with details, she was a one, and I'm not good with details. And that's why, that's why she said no. And so the next day I went in and say, oh, I, I guess you didn't understand. Because uh, she said, you, you, you can't be gone all, all this time. You're running around like I like to do. Uh, and, and besides, we can't afford to send you. And so I, I actually took the letter in this time. And I said, Jean, look, they're going to pay my way. They're going to pay my expenses. All I'm going to do is be gone on Friday afternoon, because the Saturday morning uh, is the time of the workshop. And, uh, and I can make up that half day. Uh, on, on Sunday or whenever I get back. And she said, well, sure, why didn't you say so in the first place? And so the whole idea of this kind of communications talk and discussion is to let people, let you know that you should not be asking uh, favors of uh, somebody in the way you like to ask, to, to be asked, but in the way they like to ask it. If I, if I had, at, at the first blush, talked to Jean in this way that I talked to her in the morning after, it would have been fine. But no, no I rush in and, um, and, and it just did it wrong. And so, it, it, and this, this can be applied anyway. In class, it can be applied in your personal life, it can be applied uh, in conversations and anywhere. To if if you if you want to be successful in communicating, communicate in the way that the person you're communicating with wants to be communicated with, not in the way you're most comfortable. And I suspect that many of some of you have had this experience, uh, the just absolute misunderstanding. And the purpose of that of uh, the discussion today is to see see if we can set things straight. Uh, does anybody have any? Yes. How would you go about this? Yeah, obviously, uh, you take a, this test to find out how you are, but you can't do that for your boss or for your coworker. How would you sort of start, be able to size them up? Say, well, you're, they seem to be sort of a, um, uh, you know, an S type person or a D type person. You, you, you look at these four descriptions and you, uh, you say, is this, uh, this, this person, uh, it, 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 high D people are easy, you know. They're they they they're right there jumping in, doing all this stuff. <coughs> high I people are also pretty easy, and 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 they're they're the ones that that, that talk all the time. And for for, for instance, uh, people in a grocery store, people in a grocery store, a high D person, if he's asked to bring home a loaf of bread and a gallon of milk will rush in and pick up one and forget the other. You know, he's, he can't be bothered with all these details. I, I hear giggles. A high eye person will uh, sit there and this, uh, will stand there with the shopping cart and uh, talk to all the people that go by while the ice cream melts and runs on the floor. But, but she's, she or he is a people person and, and people are very important. A high S person will have a list and will get it and get out. A high C person will figure out which, per, which brand is, is the cheapest in which 
uh, at which size is the best for, for that family. And you can, you can tell by their actions kind of which kind of people there are. Uh, some of these, some of these uh, uh, you know your D is too high and you know I is too high and all that. But my favorite is the, is the high I person. And you know your, high, uh, your I is too high when you offer to help a little old lady across the street who is sitting on her front porch at the time with no intention of going anywhere. They're high, uh, that's a high. Or uh, you, uh, your D is too high if you arrive at work at 8 a.m. Monday morning and by 8.03 no one's speaking to you. Um, there, there, are, there are little actions that you can tell. Um, and and you, what, you should do, what you should do is try to, to pick out the traits that your boss, spouse, professor, family people have. And then, and then it's tough to do, but then talk to them and communicate with them in the way that they like, not the way that you like. So do, every, do, do any of the others have, of you have any examples of miscommunicating or any communication uh, tidbits to offer? Yes. Of the toothpaste tube. <laughs> 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 That's miscommunication. <laughs> Very good. Very good. Any others? Come on, this is supposed to be interactive. Okay, let's, let's pretend that you're, you have an office and you have just returned from a vacation, two weeks vacation, and your office has been completely turned around. It may have been changed from one room to the other. How about clean? Pardon? How about clean? Well, if, if, if it was dirty, it could be cleaned up. If it's clean, it could be dirtied up, whatever. But changed in, in some way. If, if you're a high D person, how would you respond? Rearrange it? What? He would be happy. He would be happy. He would be happy. He would be happy. He would what? Put it back the way it was before. He'd put it back the way it was before. Yeah. What else? How else might? He doesn't get it. Well, maybe. I think a high D person, a high D person, he, he wouldn't care. So what? I mean, things things don't mean th things don't mean. Uh, he's not he's not in detail or anything like that. He's he, maybe he said, "Well, I, I, I should have had a bigger office long ago, or whatever." A high I person. Yeah, he, he maybe would not notice. <laughs> well, talk to everybody, see what they would, yeah, there's things to say about it. Why yeah. it would change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Talk yeah. with everybody up and down the hallway. Yeah, have a group meeting. How about a high S person? Um, probably be upset. Oh, my Lord. <laughs> what? Who's been doing this? And a high C person would be even worse. Because they like every little detail, just like just. Three bears were uh, high up. Y yes, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Okay, how how about um, how how about um, I, I, are most of you students? Yes. How about how about if you uh, if you were in a. a if you went into a lab and all of a sudden 
you found that the directions for that particular lab were missing from your backpack. Hmm? If you were a high D person, how would you? Take somebody else's. Take somebody else's. Yeah, uh, sure. That's what any any other thing for a high D person? Go on and do it. Go on and do it anyway. <laughs> right. Who needs directions, right? Um, how how about a high I person? Talk to other people. Talk to other people and get theirs. Talk to other people and get theirs. Yeah, sure. Another group. Another group. <laughs> What else? What a high, high person thing. Ask for help, probably. Ask for help, yeah. An interaction. High C or high S person? So upset. Oh, upset. What am I going to do? <coughs> what am I going to do? Okay. Um, that wouldn't happen to somebody on high C, though. They would have checked their backpack and they wouldn't Excellent. <laughs> Very good. Okay, okay, okay. The 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 way the way I had uh, I had this originally when I was when I gave this to the uh, clinical chemistry group, I I said uh, how would you what would you uh, do if your colleague asked you for a copy of the laboratory manual, and the answers were a high D P person would say what manual you know I do things the way I do things, <laughs> a high I person who may be disorganized would say, it's the third thing down on the fourth stack in this, in this uh, series on my desk. And they, they would be right. A high S person would say, you know what? I'm about to rewrite that because that's not really the procedure that we follow. And I, I see giggles in the front row. And a high C person would say, Susie down the hall Offer, uh, has, has borrowed mine since last August, but what do you want to know? I have it memorized. <laughs> so those, those kinds of people are typically uh, the high D, I, S, or C. And the whole darn purpose of this whole communications is to urge you to communicate in the way the communicatee wants to listen to it instead of the one way that you feel most comfortable with. I'm sure you have, you have some examples to share with us, and so it's time, it's time to have you all talk with me. Or otherwise it's going to be a short program. I think a lot of it might depend on the situation you're in also. For sure. I mean, because I can, I mean, I can see like in a certain situation I'd be at like an extremely high, you know, D or, you know, impatient, you know, want to get it done, you know, no matter what, just mm -hmm. get it done, right? Mm -hmm. But in other cases I can see myself dealing with, you know, different people, friends of mine or something where I might be patient or get a little more time or be open to other methods. That's great. That's good. Uh, when, when you take this particular uh, DISC program, this little booklet, it says what you, what you should do is picture yourself in a, in a situation, whether it's at a meeting, whether it's in a, in a class, whether it's in a laboratory. P picture yourself the whole time you're filling out this and the whole time you're doing this. And this is what your particular uh, profile looks like when you're in that situation. But, but you, you are very, very right to, to have uh, different situations call for different, different kinds of uh, communication. Yes? That's tough because uh, I try to I try to say this is what a high D person would do. This is what a high I and high S and high C. And I try to bring uh, some of each into into the situation analysis kind of. Uh, 
the different the different to to understand to understand how uh, D I S and C people uh, um, communicate is, is necessary, and so y this is a broad differentiation, and that's why this was this was such a good uh, comment that in its different situations you have you have a different uh, you may have a different entirely different approach, right? In large group presentations, I mean, you mentioned. And what? In large group presentations, often you have somebody use a variety of ways. Body, they'll use body language as well as pictures and. Sure, sure, and 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 they they. Um, you're very, very, very good to have a bunch of combinations like that, so that some people who are visually, uh, who like to, to do visual things, look at slides. Some people who like to hear, uh, listen, do better with, with words and, and speeches. Some people who like to do combinations, uh, some people who like to do uh, uh, action kind of things and videos and the kids who play games with, uh, with their page boys. Yes? Um, there's a lot of teachers here. Is there any suggestions you have to maybe for, for actual teachers and students to relate to one another? And well, uh, n no. I, I, I think that, that uh, a, lot, a lot of people have, uh, have no interest in finding out what people are like. Uh, a lot of people uh, could care could care less how how they're going to project how they uh, uh, communicate the way they do it come hell or hell or high water, and uh, but but for best teamwork, for instance, uh, if you're going to have uh, if you're going to have a, a research team or for matter if you're going to have a class, you need lots of different kinds of some of each different kind of person, uh, and, and if you have um, uh, a high D person, a high I person, and some S's and some C's, that's the ideal kind of team. And uh, it, it, that, that if, if, you, if you're a teacher and doing labs, then try to have this mixture at each, for each lab session or each team. Um, and and I, I, had, uh, I, I gave this to the American Chemical Society staff many years ago. And, uh, uh, I usually have a have a bunch of questions like uh, if uh, if if this person is uh, hiring uh, is uh, applying for a job and 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 the uh, the person is a high D I S or C uh, w w which one which one would you hire but and and I uh, ordinarily would. Uh, pick a high D, a high I, high S, and high C people on the same team. But the ACS said, what would happen if you have all the high Ds, all the high Is, all the high Ss, and all the high Cs in w on one team? And so we did it that way. And well, wh what, what do you think would happen? Dominant people. Dominant get done. <laughs> I, uh, the high, the, yeah, the high D people. The high D people couldn't couldn't make head or tails of the thing because they each were going to be the leader. They each had their own idea, and they didn't, they they self destructed. The high, the high the high I people, the high I people. No. They knew a lot about one another, but nothing about what they were doing. Absolutely, they 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 talked about the TV program last night, and I talked about. The baseball games or whatever, but they didn't. They didn't get uh, anywhere. The high S's and high P, the high C's got together, got together, uh, and and uh, did the problem and sat there and twiddled their thumbs while the, uh, the high D people argued and the high S people socialized. But it was it was an experiment. Well, this is similar to the Myers Briggs. It's called the DISC program, and it's uh, it's used to be by Carlton Communicating Company, but I I, I don't know if, if they even do it anymore. So you actually do? Have, I don't know if the company does. I, I took the DISC program on the web for actually for the ACS. Did you? Yes. Good. Okay. So 
So, so it, uh, where is it on the web? Uh, gee, I bet if they went, it's a, for those interested, if they probably went to a Google search and typed in D I S C. D I S C. All right. They probably would have it probably would pop up. Uh, probably a capital D, little I, capital S, capital C. Personality test. You know, you could do. Okay. That. Okay. Great. They probably could do. They probably, I wouldn't be surprised if students could probably take it on the. Uh, I'm glad. I'm glad. I'm glad. Right. I'm glad to hear it because it's it's a it's a fun kind of thing. And it's useful. And it's useful. Questions? Comments? Situations to share? Yeah? I, just, I, I mentioned ahead of time, I took the disk test. I went to the ACS. discovered that um, chemists tend to fall into three categories. Conscientious, a lot of chemists in the conscientious areas. A lot of people, a lot of chemists who are steady. A lot of chemists, there's actually a fair number of chemists out there who are dominant. Mm -hmm. Particularly if they're doing uh, academics. And you, and you were off by yourself and two uh, others yeah, for I. I. <laughs> One of like uh, three out of 40. <laughs> and, that's probably, and that's probably true because how many of you, uh, first of all, how many of you had electives at all when you were in school? How many of you uh, took psychology as one of those electives? How many of you took social studies as one of those, social science as one of those? Uh, it just doesn't appeal to technically oriented people, but it's valuable to them. Okay, thank you very much. I, ha I had as much fun as you did. <laughs>